Well, good evening. Good evening. How's everybody? Okay. Now, let's just see. We're, we're beginning uh, the advanced study weekend. My name is Dr. John McDougall. For those of you who I don't know, I have an awful lot of friends here. So I'm, I know I'm talking to the converted, but uh, my guess is you brought a couple of people here kip, kicking and screaming with good intentions, right? So I, where am I going to start in terms of, uh, many of you are my friends, but I got to make more friends this weekend. And those of you uh, watching on the internet, uh, be aware that I know that you're watching and I'm going to make every attempt I can to uh, not only uh, bring you in as good friends, but for give you the opportunity to share what I believe to be true with other people. So we have a huge internet audience watching. You folks have traveled great distance to be here with many questions, uh, things that I think will be answered this weekend. This is called the Advanced Study Weekend. Not because you have to have any previous knowledge, it's because this weekend is dedicated to bringing new information. The purpose of this weekend is to bring other opinions here different than mine. You want to hear what I have to say? Come to the 10-day program, and our entire staff will sing to you in concert the McDougal message. But that's not what this weekend is about. This weekend is about discussion, bringing new ideas, bringing people here who I am very eager to hear. We have a, a wonderful list of guest speakers. As you listen to the speakers over the weekend, do remember I did not invite them because they agree with me. I invited them because they have other points of view. So as you listen to different people speak over the weekend, you say, well, that's not what Dr. McDougal believes. Of course not. I have uh, had the opportunity to bring some of the most important people in the entire world to talk to you this weekend to share their ideas with you about health, medical care and so on. So let's give them the proper attention and uh, believe me, I'll ask them a couple of questions as we go along the way that may interest me. For those of you who are new here, uh, I want you to know just a little bit about me. I guess the most important thing for you to know is that I'm a medical doctor. I'm a board certified internist. My greatest joy in life is talking to patients and touching them. That's what I do. I'm just a simple country doctor, and don't think of me any other way. And I'm also a grandfather. I've got six grandkids, one on the way. And there are just a couple of people I'd like to introduce you to right now, even though there are, uh, are, are dozens of people who put great effort into making this weekend happen, so we'd have a good time. But there are just a few people I want to introduce you to before I get started. The McDougall program is a family business. Yes, it is. And the first McDougal I'd like to introduce you to is Chloe McDougal. Where is she? She's outside, but she's about this tall and runs around. She's my uh, sixth grandchild, own granddaughter. You'll see her here. And her parents are here. And they are uh, Dr. Craig McDougall who's a board-certified internist who works at Kaiser, and he's my son. And that is Craig right there. Okay. And then the next person I'd like you to meet is the person who runs everything. Because of her hard work, all I have to do is just come up here and be talent. I don't have to do anything else except pay attention to you and those of you on the internet and the speakers. Because everything else is taken care of by Heather McDougall, who's my oldest child. And then, uh, and then I'd like you to meet, she's outside, I think. Is Mika outside? Okay. Uh, Craig's uh, partner in life is a board-certified family practitioner, and her name is Mika McDougall. And uh, you'll see her running around here. And then, is my brother here yet? Okay, you'll meet my brother. His name is Dr. William McDougall. He's a board-certified internist, too, and he'll be here this weekend. And then the last person I want to introduce before I get on with this evening is my best friend. 
for 44 years. And that's, uh, that's Mary McDougall, who's been... <laughs> Anyway, those of you who know me know how important my family is to me. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about, uh, for those of you who are new, maybe a couple of you were brought here uh, not knowing what you're going to get into. And uh, I, I have no doubt, or at least I, I hope, my plan is, is at the end of this weekend, when we're all finished, we're going to look back and say, this was the best advanced study weekend the McDougals have ever put on. That's our plan. We started in this, Mary and I did, uh, in 1971 when we met. 1971. In 1972, uh, we went together to Hawaii and spent a year, I was a surgical resident. 1973 to 1976, I learned everything that I know. Everything. Pretty much, I don't think there's been uh, Maybe a couple little things I've learned since then, but between 1973 and 1976, I learned how to be a doctor and what people are supposed to eat because I used to be a general practitioner working on a sugar plantation on the Big Island of Hawaii, and I saw what healthy people ate, which were my first generation Japanese, Chinese, Koreans, and Filipinos. And what they ate is rice and vegetables. They had no dairy. They had a little chicken if they, their chicken lost the cockfight on Saturday. Otherwise, they had no meat. They also had no breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, heart disease, or obesity. And they worked hard into their 80s and 90s. That's what they did living on rice and vegetables. Of course, back then, between 1973 and 1976, Mary and I were still into the Western diet. We couldn't really see exactly what was going on. But I was introduced to really healthy people and what they lived on in the Philippines, Japan, China, and Korea is 90% of their food came from rice and some vegetables and virtually no dairy and occasionally a little bit of meat. They did well. They moved from their native lands to the Big Island to get a job on a sugar plantation, and they allowed me to be their doctor. And I took care of them, and I also took care of their children, who were raised on the Big Island, and uh, they got to go eat at Texas Drive-In. And the first McDonald's arrived in Hilo in 1974, Hilo, Hawaii. I was one of their first customers, and their best customers. And the children, as they abandoned the rice and took on a well-balanced diet of meat and dairy, they got fat and sick. And then the grandkids, who were also my patients between 1973 and 1976, were as fat and sick as any other American you've ever met. That's what I saw. And then just to kind of give you just a brief history, in 1976, I left the plantation. And I went back into training to learn how to be a good doctor. I became a board certified internist and I started reading the scientific research. And what I found out is that everybody else could see the same thing. And the science 40 years ago and the science today clearly says that there is an ideal diet for human beings. And I think I know what that diet is. Now, you may disagree with me, and that's okay. That's what we're here to discuss for the weekend. But I'll tell you what people should eat, I think. And, and, and the reason I keep thinking this is because every time you do this, I mean, you, 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 you know, everybody I've had a chance to meet who has suffered the consequence of eating like a king and queen, in other words, being an American, who has gotten fat, and constipated and develop high blood pressure and high cholesterol. Everybody that I've seen in the past 44 years who has made the kind of change that I've recommended, which is to eat a diet primarily of starch. Oh, and we were on such friendly terms before I mentioned that. 
Everybody that I've been able to convince that they should eat a diet of rice, potatoes, sweet potatoes, beans, peas, and lentils, bread and pasta, <clears throat> and a few vegetables and a few fruits, everybody I've met, and how many people has that been? Quite a few, maybe 10,000, who have followed that advice, every one of them has gotten better. Now, they haven't solved all their problems, but they've gotten better. And I know many of you have problems but I can't feel your pain. That's one of the things I've discovered after being around for almost 70 years, is I can't feel your pain, but I know you have pain because I'm a doctor and you tell me you have pain. And you'd like to be better. I can't solve all your problems, but I can fix one problem that I'm certain will make a huge difference, and that is that I can fix your food. And if you do as I recommend, then you will get the same results that everybody else that I recommend that this program for has gotten. Just like, remember I'm a medical doctor, I'm a board certified internist, and over 40 years not only have I told people to change their diet, but I've also told people to quit smoking. And do you know what's happened every single time that somebody quit smoking? Do you, can you imagine what happened? Do you think 50% of them had better health, or do you think it was 75% or maybe 100%? What do you think? Okay, remember I'm a doctor. I've been at this for, for 44 years. 1968 I started, so I guess that's 46 years. Every hardcore drunk I've met in the last 46 years who I've told to stop drinking the booze has gotten better. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? And everybody I've met in the last, let's just say, 38 years who I've tried to deliver this message to, who has been overweight, high cholesterol, constipated, suffering indigestion, etc., from food poisoning caused by the rich Western diet of meat, dairy, oil, sugar, etc. Everybody I've met in the last, let's just say, 38 years who's followed by dietary advice has gotten better. Can you believe that? Okay, so that's what this whole thing is about. Let me just make it real clear for those of you who are new here. I am a medical doctor. I am not an alternative medicine doctor. I'm not a, a health food doctor. I'm just a regular old board certified internist who treats dietary diseases by fixing the problem. I do have a prescription pad. I'm licensed to practice medicine in five states. I'm a board certified internist. But I try not to do that. I try and fix the problem. Just like with smokers, I don't give them cough syrup. And hardcore drunks, I don't give them alcoholic vitamins. People suffering from food poisoning, which is 99% of the people you know, I don't treat them initially with statins, blood pressure pills, or diabetic pills. What I try to do is I try to get them to fix the problem and then We'll talk about the pills. So that, that's kind of what I'm all about, and that's the way you, I would like you to think about me. <clears throat> now, most of you know this. In fact, some of you have had the great opportunity to be your doctor, and that's what I enjoy doing most. I enjoy seeing patients. I enjoy watching. Do you know how good it feels to help other people? Can you just stop for a minute and think about what you do as a business? You know, maybe you are an architect. Or maybe you're a florist. Whatever you do, the true reward in life is helping other people. Yeah? Okay, I'm a doctor. I have an opportunity to help people. And you know what happens is every time I see what I do and believe, and I do believe this, you can tell, you've already only known me for like, some of you for nine minutes. I do believe <coughs> that uh, what I do works, and you know what happens when other people buy into my message, is they get better and it makes me feel good, and that's why I keep doing it. All right, so some of you and I, you understand the program, you kind of met my family, you know who I am. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to catch up with you. Because many of you uh, are our friends and we've been together, we get together for advanced study weekends, you've been to the 10-day program, some of you travel with us to Costa Rica and Hawaii and we get a chance to really get to know each other. 
And last time we were together was in September of 2014 when we had the last advanced study weekend. And since then, I've uh, addressed a few subjects that I'd like to talk to you about. And what I'd like to do for the next 45 minutes, as long as we're real clear on the basics of who I am and what I recommend, is I'd like to talk to you about some of the new things that I've learned since we got together in September 2014. Would you indulge me for just a minute and let me tell you some of the new things that I've learned? And if you read the newsletter, you probably have, uh, have read about this. You, you probably, if you haven't, you can get the newsletters free on the website. You can kind of catch up and you get all the scientific references. But let me just kind of show you. You see who that is? That's uh, my son, who, by the way, is the future. In uh, October of 2014, with great effort, and it was a great amount of effort by myself, my son Craig, and a whole bunch of other people, we were able to get the results of our work published in the Nutrition Journal. I, yeah, but let me tell you, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. I went to the big five, the British Medical Journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, etc. I went to the big five and I said, instead of, uh, uh, advertising for the drug companies, would you mind publishing something about good food? And they all said no. They had no interest in, uh, in food. Not one. Finally, finally we were able to get Nutrition Journal, which is, uh, I think, a, a, a good deal. It worked out well for me, and uh, they've done a lot to publicize our work. And in October of 2014, we published the results of 1,615 people. So it's an observational study. We've done a randomized controlled trial with Oregon Health and Science University, which some of you may be aware of, but I'm not going to go into that. So this journal, which you, by the way, is open access. You can die. In fact, I, I would guess that uh, many of you have seen this paper. Uh, this journal published the results of 1,615 people who we locked up for 10 days and forced them to do what I believe to be proper and true, which is the food we're gonna feed you this weekend. And what we did is we did not exclude a single person as we watched what happened to these 1,615 people over 10 years. That's how long it took us to collect the data. And we saw expected results. The average weight loss was 3.1 pounds in seven days, eating as much food as people could possibly eat. 15 course meals, three times a day, they could take uh, boxes of food back to the room. I didn't care. We included skinny people, fat people, average people, everybody. And what we found was the average weight loss was 3.1 pounds. This is the weight loss for women. Men did a little bit better. And by the way, the fatter people were when they came, the more weight they lost. Men, they lost a little bit more. Yep, maybe about three point. Force feeding, eating as much as they could possibly stuff in their mouths of delicious food, which you're going to discover, those of you who are here live, are going to discover how tasty that food is. Those of you watching on the internet, you can only imagine. Uh, we saw a reduction. This is 1,615 people. We saw a reduction of cholesterol of 23 points. This did not involve changes in medication. There were no statins added or discontinued. Yet the average drop in cholesterol in seven days in 1,615 people was 23 points. Just from changing the food. And those who started with the highest cholesterol got the best results. The sicker you are, the better you're going to get. And of course, the happier I'm going to be because I told you a few minutes ago that the greatest joy in life comes from helping other people. So those of you who are in the biggest trouble are the ones that make me happiest. Anyway, if you started with a really high cholesterol, then the drops were even greater than if you stopped with a low, started with a low cholesterol. <clears throat> Blood pressure drops. We published in this journal that somewhere between 80 and 90% of people were able to get off all their blood pressure pills, and yet the drop in blood pressure was 8 over 4 millimeters of mercury. And those who were really sick with really high blood pressures, 
they got even greater reductions in numbers and stopped their blood pressure pills. And we were able to stop 80 to 90% of the diabetic medications in our diabetics who had type 2 diabetes. Yes, we did. And the blood sugar levels were about the same. OK, so uh, I, I hope you're duly impressed so far. But just to put things in perspective, I published the exact same results 20 years ago. And nobody seemed to care. That's, and so has uh, Nathan Pritikin and many other people published similar results about what happens when you change from the risk Western diet to a healthy diet. People always get better. There's no inconsistency in the scientific literature. But who cares? All right, anyway, we published the results on 500 people 20 years ago. Same results then as we get today, and if in 20 years people are still interested, they'll get the exact same results. Nothing's going to change. So we published that in October of 2014. Uh, there is no controversy, except you could say, that uh, you had a, a select group of people, so what? You locked them up and made them do it, so what? The important thing for you to know about yourself, your spouse, your family, your friends, is that there is an option. You can get well. Okay. Well, we published that in October 2014, and then I, uh, I decided to publish a, 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 something I, I avoided, but everybody asked me, and when you ask me questions, I think about it, and then eventually you force me to, to, uh, to state my opinion. And what you've been asking me for the last uh, 35 years is, what do I think about flu shots? Excuse me, I'm a food doctor. But I'm also a general doctor, so I should be paying attention to this flu stuff. And finally, finally, in November 2014, I told you what I think. You should say no to flu shots. Now, why did I decide that? Because every time I call the pharmacy to leave a prescription for a patient, I have to listen. I, as a doctor, must listen for 45 seconds uh, about a sales pitch as to why I should go in and get a flu shot, and then I get to leave the prescription. Excuse me, you're wasting my time. And then, when I go to the grocery store, as soon as I walk in the grocery store, they tell me they'll give me 10, 20, 30% off of my food if I get a flu shot. Okay, <laughs> concerns me a little bit. And every pharmacy agrees. You look, just look, every pharmacy agrees that you should get a flu shot. wonder why they do that. In fact, you can go to a, uh, a website and they'll 20, tell you 24 awesome flu shot marketing strategies. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I've been at this for, let's see, what did I tell you? I started in 1978. In 1978, <clears throat> We had the swine flu, the swine flu. You remember that, 1978? Okay, so in 1978, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, a general practitioner in Kailo, Hawaii, and two of my patients came in with transverse myelitis and were paraplegic from the flu shot. That made an impression. But still, still, well, still, you know, I would get the flu, and I do. I mean, you know, I'm, you, know you drop a bowling ball on my foot and my foot breaks. Just because I'm a vegan, well, that's not true. Just because I eat a healthy diet doesn't mean that I can stop wearing my safety belt in the car. Or I uh, am uh, no longer susceptible to the flus or colds. So uh, my thinking is back in, uh, even though I saw these two people with transverse myelitis, paraplegic from the swine flu vaccine, I said to myself, okay, you know, I can't afford to get sick, and I know that, uh, that uh, I know how immunizations are supposed to work. So we went and got flu shots for a little while, and then 
I remember probably the worst year I ever had with flu was the year I got the flu shot. And then, and then, and then I decided, you know, maybe I ought to think about this more carefully. And then what, three years ago, they came back out with a, the, another swine flu epidemic. Remember that three years ago? And uh, they didn't have enough vaccines. So all they were going to do was they were going to give vaccines to healthcare providers. And of course, I'm a healthcare provider and I got a family, I got a staff. So I used my poll and I was able to get 19, 19 vials of swine flu vaccine back about three years ago. And, uh, and I put them in the refrigerator and I said to myself and to Mary, I said, you know what? When our neighbor dies, we'll take the flying, flying flu shots. Well, the neighbor's still alive, so I didn't do that. And I think the 19 files are still in the refrigerator if anybody's interested. Okay, so anyway, that's what I'm thinking is, and so he asked me, should I get a flu shot every year? And the answer is, no, you should not. You should stop buying into this, and you know this to be true, because you read the newspaper. And the newspaper and the television people, they tell you this year's flu vaccine doesn't work. I mean, this was just like a week ago. But then they say, even though it doesn't work, you should still take it. Because, because why? Well, because somebody's making like a whole bunch of millions of dollars selling flu shots. That's why. So let's see. Okay, so anyway, you asked me this question. I decided, well, since you don't have time or maybe you don't have the background to read what's going on, and I do because I'm a real doctor, maybe I should look and see what the experts say. So what I did for you in the November of uh, 2014 newsletter is I went and looked at all the papers for you. And here they are. You can go to the November 2014 newsletter and you can read every single paper if you'd like. This is not a matter of controversy. They all say the same thing. And that is that the flu shots don't work. Even for healthcare providers, they do not work. Okay, you can read all that. You can just take a look at some of the reviews done by Cochrane, etc. So they don't work. Now, why don't they work? Well, <clears throat> let me tell you why they don't work. It's because uh, what the flu vaccine people do is they uh, take a look at what the flus were last year or the year before, or maybe three or four years in the past. They see what the strains of viruses were that came through and swept the world. And then what they do is they make a vaccine for 2015 based upon the infections that occurred in 2013, 2012, 2011. And they make these vaccines in hope that the same virus will come through and you will be protected. But it doesn't. A new virus comes through and the vaccine that you took in good faith, and let's assume there were well-intentioned people that marketed to you, are very effective against the flus that happened in the past. But not the current flu, and that's why it doesn't work. What happens, and uh, every doctor knows this, and most, diet, you know, most people involved in medicine, what happens is uh, when you're confronted with microbes, like viruses and bacteria, etc., uh, these things get into our body once they break the initial barriers of the respiratory tract and the GI tract. They get into the body these foreign substances, viruses, let's just talk about flu viruses. They get into the body, and then these viruses, they're floating around in the bloodstream. And what the body does as a second defense is it makes antibodies against that particular virus. And it's precise, specific against that virus. And so the body makes antibodies against that particular virus, and then the body remembers that virus. And so if you get that same virus affecting you again, the body has memory of that virus that makes antibodies and boom, you're protected. This is uh, 
virus specific. And as long as the same virus comes through every year, then you're protected. But if a new virus comes through, which it does, seems like every year, and that's why it didn't work, there's a new virus, then all the efforts made by the drug companies, the pharmacies, the grocery stores, your well-meaning doctors of uh, no benefit because you don't have any antibody or memory response to the new virus, and that's why it doesn't work. Okay, so don't get flu shots. Now, let me put that in proper context for you. You're sitting there thinking, how do I protect myself against the flu? You must avoid exposure and wash your hands. You can't avoid exposure because you, you, know, you go out to grocery stores and to meetings like this and you run into all kinds of sick people. So what's your only defense? Wash your hands. I don't know anything else you can do. That's the flu virus. Now let's put this in context of other infectious threats to you and your family. Every one of my children, every one of my grandchildren have been fully immunized against diseases that I've treated during my medical career. Polio, diphtheria, tetanus. I've seen people with these diseases. They are real. And there's no reason I'm going to throw the baby out with the wash water. I want my family fully protected. And so if I could get a hold of smallpox vaccine, I would give it to everybody in my family. I believe in vaccinations. Yes, I do. I could be wrong. But that's my point of view right now. There are three things that have changed the incidence of disease in all of human history and today. There are only three things. That's sanitation, improvements in sanitation, better nutrition, and vaccinations. I know you're thinking about antibiotics. No. Those are the three things that have changed the instance of disease in human history and have caused us to rise to the civilization we are today. But that doesn't mean everything that comes in a needle is good for you, and flu vaccines are a fraud. The research says so. Don't go there. But likewise, I'm telling you that there are vaccinations that you ought to seriously consider for yourselves and your families and so on. I hope I'm being clear. Well, that's one of the things you asked me to answer. You asked me to answer that in November of 2014, and I hope I've made myself absolutely clear on how I feel about this, and there is no disagreement in the scientific research. I have read it. I know what it says. Okay. So, so one other thing you asked me is you said, you said, okay, uh, Dr. McDougall, I know what the problem is. The problem is arsenic in my rice. And Dr. McDougall, you're recommending people eat rice, and obviously I shouldn't be eating rice because it's loaded with arsenic, and uh, everybody knows this because Consumers Report did a big article in November in 2012, and told you that your rice is loaded with arsenic. I refuse to answer you. But finally, you kept asking, and I had to answer you, and so I did answer you in, uh, well, in, in a newsletter that I published just recently. What uh, the Consumer Report says is it says this. It says, rice contributes to 70% of exposure to inorganic arsenic. But they go on to say, which would put it in third place behind fruits, fruit juices at 18% and vegetables at 24%. Still, all you've heard is don't eat rice. And that's all your friends have told you. Don't eat rice because it's loaded with arsenic. And you say, okay, McDougall, weigh in. Okay. Then Nature came out with their point of view, and they had an article called Contamination, the Toxic Side Effect of Rice. Well, you've got Consumers Report, you've got uh, Nature, 
two of the most respected uh, publications on the market, telling you that you should avoid eating rice. Now, if you read this Nature article, what they say is they say this. They say, the situation is especially dire in Bangladesh, where rice is the national staple. And the water is naturally high in arsenic. But that's not what the report tried to tell you. They tried to tell you that rice is a huge threat to your health. Excuse me, the problem is the water in Bangladesh. It's loaded with arsenic. The research is clear, but who cares? You can sell magazines if you tell people not to eat rice. That's what I think. And your wells in some of the places you live are highly contaminated with various types of uh, toxins, including arsenic. So check your drinking water. The problem is not the rice. Now, if you read the Consumer's Report article, they'll tell you, okay, there are some wise things that you can do as a consumer. Now, one of the things you want to do is you want to buy California-produced rice. Now, you say, what's so special about California-produced rice? What's special about California-produced rice as opposed to rice grown in the southeast United States is that rice grown in California is not grown on soils that are highly polluted with arsenic. Whereas in the southeast United States, they used to grow cotton. It was the major crop. And the boll weevil was a primary threat to the cotton crops. And guess what they did to kill the boll weevils? They sprayed them with arsenic. And what do you think happened to that arsenic? It went into the soil. And so now when they grow rice in the southeast United States, guess what it's loaded with? There's nothing wrong with rice. What's wrong is our soils are contaminated with lead and arsenic and cadmium and all kinds of garbage. Why pick on rice? Okay, so you ask me, okay, what should I do about rice? Because all my friends and neighbors say, don't eat that McDougal diet because they ask you to eat rice. All right, fine. Let's just give them, let's just give them the rice thing. What the McDougal diet is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables that minimizes your intake of oils, vegetable oils, like olive, corn, safflower oil, and animal foods like meat, dairy, eggs, et cetera. That's the McDougal diet. All right, so you're, you're sitting there thinking to yourself, all right, now I miss McDougal. He's okay sometimes, but I know he makes mistakes. So maybe he's got it wrong about this rice thing. Okay, so maybe I got it wrong. Pick another starch to center your diet around. Pick potatoes. Potatoes are the worldwide pillar of nutrition. Excuse me, whether or not populations and civilizations survived or perished depended upon the potato. You want to read about potatoes? I have three books about potatoes at home. It's an ideal food. So starch paste your diet around potatoes or sweet potatoes or corn, like the Mayas and Aztecs used to, or pasta like they did in the Mediterranean part of the world. So don't eat rice. I don't really care. But starch based your diet, in other words, most of your calories, just like my old plantation patients, those first generation Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans, they ate 90% of their food as rice, and they thrived. You don't want to eat rice? Fine. Eat potatoes. Now, the other recommendation they have is uh, don't eat brown rice. Excuse me, I spent the last 40 years being told that I need to eat whole grains. And now they're saying the arsenic is primarily concentrated in the brand. So one way to solve the problem, in addition to buying California rice, is eat white rice. 
And you're thinking, wait a minute. This flies in the face of everything I have ever learned, but it's Consumer Reports and Nature Magazine. Who's to argue with the experts? And you don't know what to do, okay? <clears throat> One of the things they forgot to mention is 90% of the intake of arsenic in the, cons in the consuming population of the US and Europe comes from seafood. Yes, it does, but somehow that didn't hit their radar screen. And what they say is, that's not important because this is organic arsenic. Excuse me, organic arsenic is toxic too. And you say, okay. Now what they're telling me is don't eat rice. And I think probably rice, I like rice. And they didn't mention seafood. Okay, so let's see. What am I going to do? Well, uh, let's see what's happened to rice consumption worldwide. If I say rice, you say China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Japan, India. Let's just say, when I say rice, you say, let's see. I've been around for 40, 50, 60, 70 years, and what I remember in all my studies and all my travels is that people in the Far East, they eat mostly rice, and there are no fat people, and they don't have breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and they're hardworking all day long, and those uh, Far East Asians, they almost won World War II, and they did beat us in the Vietnam conflict. Let's see. Am I missing something? Well, that was the Asian before 1980. What has happened in China, Japan, Vietnam, Cambodia, is they have become rich. Excuse me, they have as al almost as many Tesla supercharging stations in China as they do in the US. They have become rich in China, Cambodia, Vietnam, Japan, etc., even India. And what have they done with this wealth? Well, they've changed what they eat. Yes, they have. And so they've stopped eating so much rice. If you look at the worldwide consumption of rice, it is down all over the Far East. Yes, it is. But what's up? These are just the facts, ladies and gentlemen. What's up is the consumption of animal foods, meat and dairy, all over the world. I was in India six months ago. I told the three hospitals that I talked to that uh, China was the fattest, sickest nation in the world. And the Indian people stood up and said, you're wrong, we are. <laughs> We're the fattest, sickest people in the world. Yes, we are. That's what they told me. How could I argue? The consumption of meat and dairy has almost doubled in the last 30 years. Yes, it has, and so has the consumption of vegetable oil. So they eat less rice, more meat, more dairy, more oil. In India, Japan, China, Vietnam, every other place that you can look, want to travel, or watch a TV documentary on, they eat less rice and more meat and more dairy. And they drive more Teslas. Okay? And before 1980, I've been around a long time. I'm almost 68 years old. I'm a grandfather. I have six grandkids, one on the way. I've been at this for 46 years. And some of you have been long enough, around long enough to make the same observations that I have. Prior to 1980, there were no fat people in Vietnam, Cambodia, China, or Japan. No, there weren't. 
You could stand in a town square with 100,000 fellow citizens and you wouldn't see a single fat person. But back before 1980, 90% of their food came from rice. There was virtually no type 2 diabetes. There was no multiple sclerosis. Post-World War II Japan, they described 76 cases of prostate cancer. Before 1980, when 90% of their diet was rice, sure, they had sanitation problems. They had problems of getting enough food. They had immunization problems. But before 1980, they had no bypass surgeons. Oncology was a bad business to be in. Since 1980, what's happened is people in the Far East have become wealthy. Now, what have they done with that wealth? As people would naturally do. They have uh, improved their diet so to speak. And what has happened since 1980 when fewer than 1% of the population had type 2 diabetes and there was virtually no obesity in the Far East, what has happened is they have enthusiastically taken on the rich Western diet. And the consequences are today in China, half the people are pre-diabetic. At least that's what the Journal of the Medical, Medical Association says. 12% of the population in China has type 2 diabetes. Now maybe it's more in India. Who's here to argue? This is not a mystery as to why people are sick. The reason they're sick, and uh, you can see it every place you look, is because of food poisoning. They have switched from a starch-based diet, which 9.5 billion of the 10 billion people who've walked this planet have consumed. I'm not saying they're vegan. I'm just saying, wherever you look, be it the Aztecs or the Mayans, who are known as the people of the corn, the people of the Andes, who are potato eaters, the Incas lived on potatoes until they went to battle, and because potatoes were so hard to carry, they switched to quinoa. Or if you look at the people in the Far East who lived on rice, nine and a half billion of the 10 billion people who walked this planet consumed most of their calories from starch. Not kale, not broccoli, not cauliflower, like the modern vegan is doing not from fake soy burgers, not from 90% fat soy cheese. 90% of their calories throughout all of human history have come from starch. <clears throat> we are starch eaters. Some of you know who, what I, you know, yeah. Okay, so what happened is we took a, we took a, uh, a population of planet Earth where just a few people were wealthy and because of uh, fossil fuels in the Industrial Revolution, we were able to change the, the number of kings and queens from a few, they used to be known as pharaohs and priests and priestess in Egypt, you know, the ones that were buried in the, in the uh, pyramids you know, the Valley of the Kings. They took these few people who were eating the Western diet who died of atherosclerosis, diabetes, obesity, gallbladder disease, etc. They took their just a few people, like a few kings and queens of uh, three, 400 years ago, you know, King Henry VIII, etc. A few people who could eat really rich food because of the Industrial Revolution and because of, uh, of uh, tapping into fossil fuels, we've made it so that even the poorest people on the planet can eat at Burger King, Dairy Queen can fill their plates with imperial margarine and eat as much rich food as they can stuff in their faces, and that's why they're sick. 
Okay. So anyway. <clears throat> Rice is not the problem. Certainly you don't want to eat dirty food. You don't want your crops growing in soils contaminated with lead, arsenic, mercury, cadmium, etc. You want clean food. But there's no reason to take and declare this all out war on rice. It's not the problem. Okay, so anyway. <clears throat> then, in January, something uh, kind of important happened. One of our uh, uh, one of our fortunately frequent guest speakers is a man by the name of Dean Orish. Somebody you know who he is, some of you have heard him speak here. Uh, Dean is a world changer. Regardless of what else you want to say about Dean Orish, he has, uh, he's somebody I've known for almost 40 years. He went to <clears throat> a uh, World Economic Conference in Switzerland just recently. And he gave a speech to the world. These are all the movers and shakers. I think they had 176 private jets at the airport that day. And Dean told the public that uh, the reason people are sick is the too much rich food and the solution is to eat the Ornish diet, which I don't disagree with. So I, in January of 2015, I put up uh, an interview I did with Dr. Ornish, who is, uh, I think, one of the most important people in this movement. And I put up the uh, two discussions he did at this economic conference. Well worth your trouble to watch. And hopefully we have uh, Dean back here sometime soon. He's, he's made a huge difference. So what we're going to do this weekend, this is what I've done in the last six months, just kind of address those few things I wanted to bring you up to date. But uh, my basic core of belief has been the same for the last 38 years. People get very frustrated with me. I know they do. My colleagues, my son, some of you, that I'm just so immovable. I have this point of view that I believe in, seriously, and you know what happens when I apply this point of view? My patients get better, and they stop their medications. And they're able, I believe, to live longer. They certainly live better. And uh, my patients aren't conflicted either by headlines about global warming and livestock's contribution to the destruction of this planet. And when people who believe in what I believe in, when they see videos about uh, common farming practices, like abuse in the chicken farms and livestock farms, etc., they don't feel conflicted. I think other people must feel conflicted. I would guess they feel, I would hope they feel conflicted. I would hope that uh, your friends and relatives are out there thinking, let's see. There are people out there who are low carbers who say the way I get better health is I just stuff as much beef and cheese and chicken as my, in my face as I could possibly tolerate. They get headlines in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and they made the cover of Time Magazine in June of 2014 with a cover that says, eat more butter. The experts have been wrong. So all your friends who want to buy into exactly the opposite advice, which I know is 100% wrong, because I know who these people are, and what the science they use to support their point of view. I know that science, and I know how they lie. But you don't. And you say to yourself, well, <laughs> these other experts who uh, preach something that is best typified as the Atkins diet, today it's sold to you as grain brain and wheat belly and the vape hat surprise. Your friends say, OK, I don't know that this McDougal is right. And besides that, I don't want to believe them because I want to hear good news about my bad habits. 
So I'd like to listen to the people who say I should eat as much meat and dairy as I can stuff in my face and I should stay away from rice and potatoes because they're evil, even though nine and a half billion to the 10 billion people who've lived on this planet have lived off rice, potatoes, corn. Your friends and relatives are thinking to themselves, okay, I'd rather believe the low carbers and I don't want to listen to Dr. Ornish, Dr. Bernard, Nathan Pritikson's previous teachings, what McDougal has to say. I want to listen to the new diet experts on how to lose weight. So they just say to themselves, okay, I'm going to listen to the other guys because it fits into what I want to do. It's good news about your bad habits. These people are conflicted. Your friends and relatives are conflicted because they are dealing with other issues which I believe are uh, of even more importance than whether or not you die of diabetes or you die of colon cancer. I think there's something more important than that. Remember, I'm a grandfather. I got six grandkids, one on the way. I'm all done. Believe me, I'm all done. I've done the best I can. But there is a future, and that future depends upon the environment, and at least half of the destruction of the environment is caused by the livestock industry, and they must be stopped. Yes, they must be stopped. So your friends are conflicted. They say, I want to believe the experts who say I should eat as many cows and pigs and chickens and their uh, secretion products as I can possibly stuff into my mouth. Let's see. Uh, California is uh, going to probably go under economically because of a drought. We were in New York last week and it was still snowing. And the people on the East Coast consider this the worst winter they've ever had. And what did they just do? In Florida, in Florida, somebody told me they just passed a law that you can't talk about global warming. Is that, is that right? Florida, they just passed? Yeah. So you got uh, Florida, which is about to be buried in seawater. <sighs> okay, so your friends are conflicted. They don't know how to lose weight. They're pretty sure that they'd rather follow bacon, butter, and brie than eat rice, corn, and potatoes. But they've also heard that at least half the environmental damage is caused by the livestock industry. And they also saw this video about the chickens being locked in a cage and the cows being, they're really conflicted, they're having a problem. But you don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. I'm not conflicted. I don't care whether you're a Christian, a Jew, a Hindu, or whatever you are, your book of religion teaches you what I believe to be true. You're not conflicted. Until you understand the importance of a starch-based diet and how it will determine whether or not you're fat or sick, whether or not you frequent doctor's offices, whether or not you are a victim of cardiologists, heart surgeons, and oncologists, until you figure this out, that there is an answer, and that is that human beings are starch eaters, and until you personally change to that kind of diet and regain your health and personal appearance, until your community makes that change and helps the children, who, by the way, are fat and sick and constipated, the kids are. Civilized people take care of their children. Barbaric people don't. We are civilized people. Our children are sick. Until you figure out the importance of a starch-based diet and why people are sick, you'll be conflicted. But once you figure this out, you'll understand how to get well, how to help the children, how to stop the runaway health care costs, how to uh, fix the environment, at least in part. There are so many other things that have to be done. How to get over the thought of that what you're eating well, I'm not going to go there because that's not what this weekend is about, but I do think we have an environmental expert here from PETA who's going to probably beat you up a little bit about the animal rights issues because it's important. Until you get this all figured out, you're going to be conflicted, you're going to be out of control, and uh, we have no future. But we can change all that. Yes, we can. 
We can change all that if we stand up and face the truth, look at the scientific research, look at what's happened worldwide, consider the environmental issues, what the medical research says, and just say, you know what? I'm tired of hearing your nonsense. I know what the truth is. I know how I should act. I'm working at it every day. And then I think everything will just work out. But Mary says, you're such an optimist. <laughs> well, Mary, remember what I told you. You've seen me depressed three days in the last 44 years. We don't want to see a fourth day. <laughs> I am an optimist. I think we can change the world. I think the truth will, will win. I do believe that. That's the way I was raised. The truth will win. I think we have a future. Our children have a future. My grandkids have a future. This planet Earth has a future. But we must fix one thing, and that's the food. That's why you're here. That's what the McDougall program is all about. I appreciate you traveling from long distances. I can't feel your pain, but I know it's there. And we have one solution. So those of you who listen on the internet, those of you who have taken the trouble to come here, give us a chance to explain to you what we believe to be true and see if it applies. See if you can find value in it. See if it works for you. It's worked for me. Mary, do we have dinner? Thank you very much. We have an extremely exciting weekend looking forward to it. And uh, let's have a nice dinner. We'll start again, Heather, at 7 o'clock. Well, anyway, we will start again, and we have uh, a fantastic evening and weekend set out for you. Thank you.